as Melody and I were, so, so we were talking about how we saw some, some women just in pure political, uh, intensely pure political moves, uh, working for the right uh, to, um, to gain the right to vote. And then you, we saw someone like Carolyn Morgan Klaus, who just through her insistence that she succeed in a field that had been really reserved, but the men really preferred to keep it to themselves. We came up with this idea that we would look at both the political voices of women and it's a big enough span of time, you kind of end up with two generations, the first being very influenced by Quakerism and the second locally being very influenced by Vassar College, among other things. And uh, on the talent side, probably no better story than Carolyn Klaus, uh, because we also ask ourselves, how did a woman of such talent and international repute come to be almost forgotten, but not? <laughs> So uh, I'll, I will go over this, uh, the portion that's focuses more on politics and uh, Carrie Chapman Cat was in Poughkeepsie, I think visiting Vassar College in 1938. And uh, she described the effort uh, of women's suffrage as the struggle of a 72 years campaign, won by the devoted capacity of many women to perform drudgery. And it really was the, uh, that 72 year span from the uh, Seneca Falls Convention in 1848 until women gained the national right in 1920. Um, that is a long, that's a long span of time. Uh, and we've kind of break it down into three sections all through the lens of Dutchess County. The first being between 1848, the Seneca Falls Convention and 1880. 1880 was the year that women gained the right to vote in New York state, but only in school elections. There was some comfort in allowing women to be involved with decisions that related to children. And by the way, a lot of women were paying property and school taxes. And they argued successfully that this was uh, taxation without representation. Then you get into this period between 1800 and 1900 that is kind of an interim period between the two generations. Um, there's not necessarily a, a, a lot happening. And then you have this last leg between 1900 and 1920, and really even within that, the last decade. So uh, we'll look at that in, the, in those three sections. Um, Lucretia Mott, I like to call her the face of radical feminism, right, in, in 1848, uh, and because uh, Quakers were so involved uh, in movements at the time that included temperance and women's equality. The more I've studied it though, I've uh, put a little bit more emphasis on uh, what was going on in the Methodist church and uh, the woman to the right here, uh, I'll talk about a bit. She started out as a Methodist preacher, was rejected, went on to temperance work. Uh, and this, this kind of interweaving of temperance and women's equality was very, uh, uh, very common. And then here we have an old school tax bill showing that uh, Marietta Frost and other women owned property and paid taxes. And those are kind of the uh, hallmarks of that period. This interim period um, is, uh, is a time, I, the, the, this, the women, the association with bicycles and freedom and independence and the description of women at this time as a new woman, the, the new woman was a woman who was on bicycle and, and free. It says uh, at last on the far right. And you see I, perhaps a husband or something out in the dust in the back. And, but these were a lot of kind of symbolic, not well, somewhat symbolic, uh, but, but important discussions about uh, independence. Uh, this is when women talked about dress reform. Uh, one of the things you need on a bicycle is uh, more freedom of dress. So you have that interim period and then really have the, uh, the run up to the end. And if you're really looking at Dutchess County, um, there's no way of avoiding uh, uh, Laura Wiley pictured on the left, the Vassar professors being the central woman because to that point, Vassar voices were really not ex allowed or expected to be uh, in the political realm. And what Laura Wiley from Vassar College really embodies is the notion that women were seeking the vote 
not as a matter of principle because they felt they should be treated equally, but they actually had aggressive civic ends in mind. They wanted to do things. And Laura Wiley, like other women who, uh, once they achieved the right to vote, um, in, this, in her case, formed the, uh, the city and county club and got uh, hard to, at work on uh, social reforms. So she wasted no time in getting the vote and then uh, working on changing society. The other things worth mentioning, the real tipping point, World War II, uh, the suffrage. <laughs> a lot of women uh, successfully turned their suffrage efforts into supporting the war so that by uh, 1920, we actually find a woman on the ballot, Anna Roselle. I'll talk about her a little bit later, but this third period really is the, uh, the final wrap, uh, a run up and lap. We talk about the Seneca Falls Convention and it was there that um, there was an awareness that native people had uh, in, in, in certain uh, cultures, native people, women had a lot of more rights than uh, were granted women under Dutch or then uh, English law. And there was a cartoon at the time kind of suggesting that it, we would do well to remember that Indian women, uh, native women, um, historically had uh, important roles that uh, they didn't in their, uh, that the European counterparts didn't. And that the notion of uh, women being able to be uh, capable of these kinds of decisions and responsibilities and not so fragile, um, was actually quite an old idea. But if we focus on this period from the Seneca Falls Convention, it's worth just understanding how important peace was to Quakers. They actually uh, came into Dutchess County, you can see here, in a first wave in the early 1700s, leaving Rhode Island, Massachusetts, going to the parts of the county that were either far east, like the Oblong or in the center, uh, to avoid um, conflict people, they really sought peace. Along comes the Civil War, uh, fish kill, Southern Duchess becomes a major uh, revolutionary war, a military depot, and they get pushed further north in the 1700s into the 1800s, still in pursuit of peace uh, and, and peaceful space. And the, the, uh, the challenge the group had, of course, in the early 1800s was a split over orthodox, uh, how conservative or progressive uh, the, the faith should be. And as Quakerism declined as a religion in the 1800s, we see, saw these women emerge who had been kind of born of these Quaker principles that suggested women have equal roles, women have equal respect. And they took those principles in different ways uh, and into different, uh, into different um, parts of the world. The, perhaps most famous part of the uh, Quaker community at the time was the nine partner boarding school. And it's where Lucretia Mott um, uh, attended, uh, first attended as a student and then taught and, and met her husband. So, and she was greatly influenced by this school. So that by the time you get to 1848 at Seneca Falls, four out of the five organizers, including Lucretia Mott, were uh, raised Quakers. So there's no doubt that they had uh, such an influence. There were other Quakers uh, who, again, as Quakerism uh, uh, kind of went into decline, found other roots. Jill, Julia Wilbur was a Quaker from Milan. She went to the South. She was very active in anti-slavery. She broke the law and she insisted on voting <laughs> in Virginia. Um, uh, uh, Elizabeth Powell Bond in the middle became the Dean of Swarthmore College for 25 years. And the Reverend Amanda Deo, from, who was a Quaker from Clinton, uh, became a universalist preacher and with her husband, uh, the head of the County Peace Society. And she traveled all over the world as a leader in, uh, in peace. <clears throat> a couple other Quakers I mentioned, uh, Melody will uh, mention briefly Mariah Mitchell. But it's interesting because uh, it's a good example of what a very capable uh, woman at Vassar College was expected to do. She was the founder of the American Association for Advancement of Women, and that was fine, but she was not expected or allowed to be involved in political discussions is what they would have been considered around things like 
um, suffrage. So here, here's a very capable woman who uh, had to keep her own uh, views about suffrage and equality to herself, but that didn't mean she couldn't invite someone. And in 1868, she invited to her famous uh, observatory where she had these wonderful uh, little sessions, this woman, Anna Dickinson. Anna Dickinson was a Quaker known for her talk called Idiots and Women. She was talking about what New York state law uh, prescribed as <laughs> those who couldn't vote. Uh, and uh, she, she described it thus. It's interesting, I think, that as uh, Anna Dickinson was getting ready to speak, Matthew Vassar suddenly had to leave. And he left, he left the room. Um, he wasn't there when she spoke. I'm not sure how much to read into that. But the, the college was really not very active um, in allowing, they, they weren't that excited about having this kind of political discussion. That would change. Uh, meanwhile, you have also have the Amenia Seminary, a uh, strong Methodist church, and this the first woman licensed as a Methodist preacher. It's from Ulster County, but very active in Dutchess County. Widow Van Cott for decades is able to uh, create a lot of uh, converts. And there's always a tension. Uh, these women often could get a local license, but the, the national organization would resist. Uh, that's what happened with Anna Howard Shaw. She becomes uh, a preacher. She's not local to here, but I, I mention her because she's an early Methodist uh, um, uh, preacher and she uh, comes up later uh, locally. But at this point, she's not a, not a local woman. And then this woman, uh, Catherine Lent Stevenson goes to Boston University School of Theology, becomes a licensed uh, preacher in the Methodist Church, but is very actively pushed out by the National Association and regirds her, <laughs> redirects her energy um, into uh, uh, suffrage. And there's this very interesting article in 1877, bottom right, HML, is written by uh, this woman, Helen Loader from Poughkeepsie, woman uh, from, uh, very far ahead of her time. She's actually writing in a suffrage journal about the struggle of this woman's effort to become a preacher, and uh, which ultimately fails. Uh, this woman's, uh, Catherine uh, Lynn Stevenson's efforts go into the WCTU where she, she becomes a very famous global traveler and leader for temperance and suffrage and writes that the WCTU still exists and they're, they're uh, one of the, the major, if not the major songs that they have is written by, by uh, this is Catherine Lent. And uh, she became very famous within the WCTU, even though given that the Methodist church would not have her as a preacher. By 1880, uh, women gained the right to vote, as I had mentioned in school elections, um, and it's very interesting to see where, what happens. <laughs> uh, the law is constructed such that it seems not to be, it's debatable, but it seems to be not so much targeting cities, but the rural areas. So if you look at suddenly women can vote in school elections and be candidates, where do they vote? And what is interesting is that they vote and in one instance become a candidate in the Quaker areas of Dutchess County. Uh, and uh, around Vassar College. <laughs> so it's, it's the Quakers and Vassar College again. As a matter of fact, that green dot is called Coffin Summit. Lucretia Mott was Lucretia Coffin uh, Mott. And uh, so we're not only talking about Quakers, we're talking about relatives of Lucretia Mott. But, but in this instance, in 1880, we're talking about a handful uh, of women daring to vote. In Poughkeepsie, they got rebuffed. In the other areas, they were at least allowed to vote. We have our first woman elected uh, to an office in Dutchess County. Mary Boyd Duncan is elected <laughs> as clerk for the school district number 10 in Unionvale. Uh, what I find interesting is she's a daughter of Irish immigrants. And as you look at the women that emerge over the next 10, 20, 30, 40 years as both activists and candidates, there are a lot of Irish immigrant uh, daughters. Um, and in this case, Mrs. Austin B. Duncan's been elected clerk of school district 
um, and it goes on to talk about her family. But this is the, the first election of a, of a woman in Dutchess County. I mentioned Helen Loder only uh, because she was a woman way ahead of her time. What you find in the second generation is a coming together of the elite voices uh, against uh, voting, uh, encouraging suffrage. You have you know, the river estates, you have working class factory uh, uh, men and women. Um, you really have all strata of society. So it was a little unusual in the eight, early 1880s to have a working class woman like Helen Loder so active and so successful and she ends up being uh, on the on the on the ticket, supporting Bella Lockwood for president, but she is a uh, uh, sh she lives with her husband who works for the railroad. Their house is adjacent to the railroad tracks on Hamilton Street in Poughkeepsie. A very working class woman, but boy, did she write a lot and agitate a lot. But she was somewhat alone for a woman of her class in that period. And we find that she dies in 1903, and this is where you get into that gap. Uh, uh, or you realize how great the gap was between generations. So in 1903, they're writing uh, about Mrs. Helen Loder, formerly of Poughkeepsie, died at her home on Long Island. She was one at one time a very prominent temperance worker, active in the women's suffrage movement. Um, and you can kind of hear how the how distant in the past that is. And uh, this is and yet this is 1903. So in a lot of ways that that first generation activity um, uh, is, is going away. And in, in the interim, as I said, I kind of like, we, we did a contest on Facebook um, asking for pictures of grandmothers and great grandmothers from the 1880s and 90s. And their, Jean Gard from Poughkeepsie gave us the one in the middle, it's my favorite. But the head of the WCTU literally wrote the book, How I Learned to Ride the Bicycle. And that is her uh, picture on the right. And obviously, you know, how I learned to ride the bicycle, I think, is really just uh, shorthand for how I learned to be independent. Um, <laughs> and she has these wonderful photos of herself struggling through it all, see first surrounded by men and then uh, ultimately free at last. It's a wonderful little story, I think. Um, these are other photos we got from our little contest. Uh, I found this, this is the kind of thing I was talking about in terms of uh, it being a period when women were saying, uh, I'm going to reject this heavy, cumbersome dress. I want more freedom. I want to be uh, healthier. I want to be more poised. I want to be more um, aware of, of my physical self. And you had lectures like this in Poughkeepsie from women, famous women like uh, the Jeunesse. I think there were sisters who, uh, who became quite prominent in that. If we look at the, the, the last lap, as I call it, um, and in this period, there's kind of a little uh, emergence of things in 1901 in Poughkeepsie. Remember Anna Shaw, uh, she's, she's older now, but she holds a suffrage rally in 1901 as kind of like a, a sign of, of things to come. And it, because it, there really isn't uh, a groundswell of local support, and there really isn't a local organization until 1910. And in 1910, Laura Wiley creates the Equal Suffrage League, and this becomes a kind of catalyst point that brings River Estate, more elite women, uh, working class women, Vassar women. Uh, it, it brings all uh, these diverse uh, uh, women from different parts of society together. Uh, uh, and uh, Laura Wiley very intentionally lived off campus with her partner, Gertrude Buck, and they lived in that house that still stands there. It's just uh, adjacent to the fountain. And this, their home became very well known as, uh, as an outpost for um, a meeting place for issues related to uh, women's equality and suffrage. So quite unlike Mariah Mitchell, we now have a Vassar professor, although she feels she must live off campus, which is interesting, uh, with her partner who makes no uh, bones about the fact that she's advocating for quality so that things can get done. Uh, the, this is what I mean about everybody starting to get on board. So you have the, um, you have the male superintendent of schools supporting suffrage. Uh, 
uh, you have, uh, the, without television or radio, the mass medium of the time was, was a kind of these parades and uh, pageants. And by 1912, as we're kind of, you know, running up to, to, to the finish line here, um, this woman uh, ends up saying she's going to march from New York City to Albany with a message for the governor and does. And she chooses the end of December. I'm not sure why, but I, I think to show that uh, she has she has background and uh, calling themselves pilgrims, they, they, they trop through late December, stopping in... Uh, Fishkill, Wappinger, Poughkeepsie, Rhinebeck, Red Hook, and up to Hudson and Albany. And they do, they do make it. And as I say, these kinds of pageants and parades, like were held at Troutbeck, where um, uh, there was a, the, the very progressive uh, efforts for both um, uh, black equality, women's equality uh, at Troutbeck. Um, this is a tableau that was depicting those states in the West that had become uh, suffrage states. And the question at that time in 1912 was why, why, why not New York? So again, these were ways, these were field days that were had to get farmers, farmers' children, to really reach uh, rural day-to-day -day people in Dutchess County and reach them with a message. It was interesting to find in 1914, the local group uh, with Laura Wiley uh, spoke at the AME Zion Church in Poughkeepsie and this Sadie Peterson read a poem entitled The Suffrage Call uh, and she went on to be the librarian at Tuskegee after World War I at the Veterans Hospital, a very storied career in uh, using books and reading to help, to help heal. But so this is what I mean, there were at least attempts, there was a change of guard at Vassar in 1915, and the change of guard at Vassar is even more encouraged uh, voices to be heard from Vassar for suffrage. But despite that, in 1915, a referendum failed in New York. And again, the areas, the little areas of support you had in Dutchess County were uh, tended to be in Quaker areas. And it really is the war that, uh, brings it home because uh, suddenly work needs to get done and you need people, whether they're men, women, uh, what you need the best person for the job. And it is decided that these defense councils, like we just saw at a county level, should quote, have at least one woman. I was thinking, you know, you can't have less than that, <laughs> have one. So the, the governor suggested that we have at least one woman. And of course the women performed well, but they were freeing up men, they were driving tractors to free up men to go to war. This is a woman from uh, Vassar College. Women were becoming trolley conductors. Women were working in factories. Colored women were to be given work in local factories. We might have a policewoman. <laughs> uh, and uh, this is my point that the, 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 the women working for suffrage uh, very publicly turned their efforts to um, support the war. Women were uh, delivering things on bicycles. And on the elite side of things, um, Ruth Morgan from Statsburg became head of the Colony Club. And uh, you had this wide spectrum of women from Dutchess County in both kind of influential elite positions and day-to-day uh, -day, day positions. So that by November of 1917, really with women coming up and doing the, the hard work, um, even though there were more people in Dutchess County saying yes, the county still couldn't bring itself to say yes, but the state did. And that's all that mattered. And I'll end on this, uh, I thought, beautiful note uh, um, from Violet Barber, who is at Vassar, looking back at how women performed in the war. She said, speaking generally, one may say that women gained more and lost less than our brief experience with the war. Working women respected themselves for being workers, a sentiment that is a class they had not entertained before. If women are to gain ground in the economics of the future, they must enter upon their labor, labor with the will and spirit as they did during the war. And so it really was a, a, a moment of reflection and you did find 
women stepping forward, uh, uh, Anna Roselle, overseer of the poor in uh, Clinton, becomes the first woman outside of school to become elected. And uh, as of the nine, year 1918, women could vote and be candidates and really were sustained through the Women's City and County Club and the League of Women Voters after that. It was a little bit of a whirlwind, but um, that's kind of how we got from 1848 to 1920. And I am going to hand over to Melody. Thank you, Bill. Um, as we've already noted, 2020 marked the 100th anniversary of national suffrage for women. And the Dutchess County Historical Society took that opportunity to focus its programming on women, especially their voices and their talents. I'm sure you, like me, feel like that was a lifetime ago. And indeed, we were to deliver this talk to you a year ago. But despite the delay, the story is still relevant, especially to a women's group. Bill has revealed the many women of Duchess who successfully use their voices to push for greater rights for women and specifically the right to vote. I'd like to end our program by turning our attention to the second part of the 2020 theme, women's talents, and specifically the talent of one woman of Dutchess County, Caroline Morgan Clowes. 19 of her paintings, dozens of her sketches and hundreds of letters were gifted to the society in 2019. And we working with historians art historians, appraisers, and family members have come to believe that she was one of, if not the best, animal painter in America of her time. I think Bill will scroll through at least six examples of her wonderful paintings. And these are among the 19 that we received as part of the collection. I think her skill immediately comes through to you in the way she painted animals, as you will learn. Beginning in 2012, the Historical Society was the recipient of an enormous collection of materials related to the Hart Hubbard family of LaGrange. In 1838, the Hart family moved from Long Island to Dutchess County and established an apple orchard and business that would continue for 125 years. The thousands of documents in the archive detail not only their business life, but their personal life as well. The same year that Benjamin and Elizabeth Hart came to Overlook Road in the town of LaGrange, Benjamin's sister, Elizabeth Ann Clowes, gave birth on Long Island to her second daughter, Caroline. Two years later, on October 19, 1840, Caroline's mother gave birth to another daughter, Ellen. Sadly, Elizabeth Clowes only survived her daughter's birth by two months, and on Christmas Eve, 1840, she died, following at least two years of wasting away with consumption. On her deathbed, she wrote out her burial wishes and penned letters to each of her three daughters. Still more sorrow followed when on October 10th, 1841, baby Ellen, not quite a year old, also passed away. Caroline and her older sister Lydia were left motherless to be cared for by their father, William Jones Clowes. Records suggest that William was at best a distracted father. Fanatically interested in mathematical theories that he felt could bridge the gap between faith and science. He was ill-equipped to find a way to ensure the financial security of his daughters. We have hundreds and hundreds of his letters, most focused on ideas that were then and now barely understandable. By 1851, it was clear to extended family members that something had to be done about Lydia and Caroline, who were now 15 and 13 respectively, and virtual, if not true, orphans. Here in the story is where fate plays a hand. While we don't know the specifics about how the decision was made, we do know that it was decided that the sisters would be split up and would go to live with family members. Lydia to her Aunt Lizzie, sometimes called Betsy and her husband, the Reverend Reuben Lindsay Coleman, who were living in Virginia, 
and Caroline to her mother's brother, Benjamin Hall Hart and his wife, Elizabeth of LaGrange. The two households could not have been more different. Mrs. Coleman, now Lydia's foster mother, was only 12 years older than Lydia herself. Her husband was 16 years her elder. The Reverend and Mrs. Coleman had only been married five years when Lydia moved in with them. And by the time that Lydia arrived, the Coleman's had three children under the age of five. It's easy to think that Lydia was more household help than daughter. Eventually the Coleman's would have eight children and in none of the genealogies or family histories online is there a mention of Lydia being a member of the household. Records do reveal that Betsy, Mrs. Coleman, was sent to live with the Klaus family when her aunt Elizabeth lay dying and she formed a close bond with Lydia and Caroline at that time. The gods were working in Caroline's favor, however. Heartsease, as the home you see here in LaGrange was called, was given a blessing by the boss carpenter when construction was completed in 1839. Peace and plenty, always full and never empty. And so it was. Generation after generation, as you see in this photograph of family members, came to live at Heartsease. Caroline is third from the right, the tiny little woman there. Some for a short time and others like Caroline for their entire lives. Whereas the Christmas season might previously have been a reminder of her mother's death, Christmas of 1851, Caroline's first Christmas at Heart's Ease, found her in a whole new world. One of her gifts that year was five drawing books from her aunt Adelia Nichols, who also lived at Heart's Ease. Caroline wrote to her sister Lydia about the books, from which I hope I will soon learn to draw well. It seems such a small gift, but in a way it was also Caroline's rebirth in a loving household where her talent was recognized and nurtured. Among the earliest pencil sketches in the collection is this one, dated 1853. Clearly her 1851 Christmas wish was being realized. She was indeed learning to draw well. Her more formal training began at the Poughkeepsie Female Academy, located at 12 Cannon Street. Opened in 1837, the school was considered a first-class school in every sense. The course of study there included all the basics of the time, Latin and French, geology, algebra, penmanship, and elocution and others may be not so basic. Evidences of Christianity, the etymology of words with their prefixes and suffixes and mental philosophy. Among the optional courses that attracted Caroline were drawing, pencil, crayon, painting in watercolors or oils and sketching from nature. The walk from Overlook Road, depending on the route was at least five miles one way and would easily have taken her an hour and a quarter to get there. There is additional evidence that she took lessons from Samuel F. B. Morse. For at least three years, from 1862 to 1865, Caroline studied with Frederick Rondell. Harris born and trained, Rondell was lured to Poughkeepsie by Matthew Vassar to paint documentary pictures of his three ancestral homes. On February 10th, 1862, Rondell took out a newspaper ad announcing the opening of his studio for ladies at his residence on Mansion Square, the corner of, of Clinton Street. He was also a professor of painting at the Cottage Hill Academy. Beyond his role as an art instructor, Rondell became a friend and mentor to Caroline, advising her not only on her art, but also on the business side of her career. An 1865 entry in her cousin Edmund Hart's diary recounts a chance meeting with Mr. Rondell in Farnham's drugstore, where Rondell was profuse in his expression of admiration of Carey's artistic efforts. He predicts a brilliant reputation for her in a very few years if she only labors as assiduously in the cultivation of her talents as she has done. Hart also recorded that Rondell brought his students to painting parties along the Wappingers Creek at Hartsees. 
Another great influence on her development as an artist was a group of people brought to Poughkeepsie by Matthew Vassar for his great experiment, a college dedicated to the higher education of women. Although Caroline was never formally enrolled as a student at the college, she somehow became enmeshed in the culture of the institution and formed a close circle of friends, teachers, and mentors from those associated with Vassar and attended dozens of college programs and events as evidenced by invitations and programs. Dutchman Henry Van Ingen was hired as the college's first professor of art and art history. Educated in The Hague, he had specialized in landscape painting. Van Ingen was known for leading students out of the classroom to sketch nature. How Caroline came to know him is unknown but they became friends and he encouraged her, advised her and in 1878, purchased her painting, Contentment, for the art collection being developed at the college, promising his students that they would meet Miss Klaus, the artist. One of the more unusual friendships that Caroline formed at Vassar College was the one she established with Mariah Mitchell. Appointed in 1865 to be included in the original nine-member faculty, Mariah and her weird father took up residence in the observatory, the first building that was completed on campus. Again, there's no documentation as to how the two women became friends, but they were close enough that the unmarried Mitchell felt comfortable encouraging Caroline to meet Chester Arthur. Mitchell wrote to Caroline, he was well-born, is well-trained, sufficiently educated, and very efficient. He is remarkably handsome. I think your domestic happiness will be perfect as his tastes are aristocratic. It will be best for you to come for him with a carriage. Feed him well and make much of him and he will not stray. One presumes it wasn't the Chester Arthur, but in any event, the matchmaking didn't work out as Caroline, like Mariah, remained unmarried throughout her life. The late 1860s through the 1870s finds Caroline in her most productive and prolific years as an artist. Dozens of letters from Archibald Wilson, bookseller and stationer at 295 Main Street in Poughkeepsie, report on sales of her pictures. Sold the Cosette for $250 without frame, the Dr. Beadle of this city, April 1873, sold the investigation for $400 with a new frame. These are pretty high prices in that time frame. 1876, sold the lambs to John P. Adrian's for $70. And here's an example of the type of lamb paintings that she was creating in this time period. In the summer of 1872, her uncle Benjamin, recognizing her successful career, created a studio for her at Heart's Ease. The building still remains today and is in family ownership, as is Heart's Ease itself. The crowning achievement of her career was her selection as one of the exhibitors in the 1876 Centennial Exhibition in Philadelphia. Considered one of the signal cultural events in mid 19th century America, her painting, Cattle at the Brook, hung not in the women's gallery, but in the main gallery with the likes of John Lafarge, Sanford Gifford, Jervis McAtee, and Albert Bierstadt. This view of the main gallery shows her painting's placement, you can see it encircled in the upper left, in a style of installation that was common for the period. With national acceptance accomplished, Caroline became a local leader in the art world. And in 1882, along with her friend, Henry Van Ingen, artist James Smiley and sculptor George Bissell, she was selected to be on the exhibition committee for the first art show at the recently completed Vassar Brothers Institute. 167 paintings, if you can imagine that, were exhibited in seven galleries throughout the three floors of the building. 30 paintings were displayed in the south room in the first floor in a fashion, as we see here, much similar to that main gallery at the Centennial Exhibition. Caroline herself had five paintings in the exhibition along with those done by her friends and mentors, Van Ingen and Rondell. 
Among other noted artists of the day shown in the exhibit were Lily Spencer, Frederick Church, Jasper Cropsey, the Smiley Brothers, and Sanford Gifford. Many of the paintings were loaned by the elite of Poughkeepsie, J.F. Winslow, George Innes, J.P. Adrians, W.H. Talmadge, and Mrs. Samuel F.B. Morse. An 1881 newspaper clipping found in Caroline's purse suggests she was confident in the choices she had made for herself over the past three decades, declaring a woman's place is the one she can fill. While the Centennial Exposition was a great moment in American art, it was at the same time a period of great tension in the East Coast art community. A confrontation between New York landscape painters who supported native training and the figure painters of Philadelphia and Boston who advocated European study. Ultimately, the latter would prevail and Caroline and others like her would fall from favor and quite likely the commercial success she once enjoyed would diminish. Not much is down about her later years, perhaps among the hundreds of letters still unread, we'll find out how she spent those years. We do know she continued to paint and to find inspiration in the fields surrounding her studio and her lifelong home heart's ease. In 1859, Caroline wrote to Caroline, excuse me, Lydia wrote to Caroline and said, you say you are wedded to your easel. And so it seems she was. Fulfilling the promise she made to herself to learn to draw well, she mastered her craft and left behind an incredible body of work that attests to the quality of women artists of the time who were often overlooked and marginalized, choosing to sign their paintings with their initials instead of their full name so as not to reveal their sex. We know from a document in our collection that this was true for her because she received a letter in 1870 from her friend J.H. Wright, who was placing her paintings at Goupil's, which was a major gallery saying, Goupil's suppose that you are a gentleman and I did not correct them. They predict a brilliant future for you. When your reputation is thoroughly established, I shall claim the pleasure to introduce you to them and enjoy seeing their astonished faces. And later in life, she began to sign her paintings with her full name, with her full name, Caroline M. Klaus. Family records indicate that Evensong, shown here alongside a later photograph of her, may be the last painting she completed before she died in 1904. For me, there's something comforting about the sheep finding safe shelter in the upended roots of the great tree, much like Carolyn had found her safe shelter at Heartsease. We've restored her paintings. The job ahead is to restore her legacy. And while the exhibition of the work we had planned for 2020 was canceled due to COVID, we look forward to doing that as soon as we can safely do so. And we believe that will firmly establish her place in the world of 19th century American art. The last three paintings we're showing you um, are very exciting to us because since we have posted her story on our website, we have been contacted by individuals who have in their collections paintings of Carolyn Clowes that they didn't know anything about. And so we are thrilled to find these things sort of coming out of attics and coming out of people's homes. And we know that so many of her paintings were sold to people in Poughkeepsie. So we do hope that as the story becomes better and better known, more and more people will recognize that they have um, wonderful paintings from a wonderful American female artist. Thank you very much for your attention.